And what I wanted to do, what I thought I would do is rather than sort of repeat um, the argument that I've been making um, really over the years um, now, I thought I'd just give it another angle by introducing uh, the question of um, China um, into the discussion. So of course I agree uh, with Kevin that the Soviet Union remains a, you know, a real living issue uh, today. Um, it affects us in all, all manner of different ways, both uh, positive and negative. Uh, I mean, here I am in Britain, what survives of the NHS we can sort of talk about, but uh, at least in my view, uh, the reason why we have um, universal suffrage in Britain, the NHS, um, the social security system to the extent, as, as I say, that it survives, is in no small part uh, due uh, to the Soviet Union, but also I would argue that one of the reasons, or any one, but one of the reasons why um, socialism um, in countries, either the advanced capitalist countries has proved to be so unattractive um, is also because of the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union has had uh, an incredibly, an incredible impact, uh, but also a paradoxical um, um, impact. So just to go back, I know uh, comrades here will all, all know it, uh, so I'm not going to over egg it. Going back to 1917, you can certainly find quotes uh, from Lenin, not least when he's discussing uh, the crisis that's um, looming in um, revolutionary Russia, and I'm talking about the provisional revolutionary uh, government, so from February. You can read Lenin uh, basically saying uh, that within Russia itself, uh, we have all the material resources that we need um, for socialism. Of course, what he meant by that wasn't socialism, but steps towards um, socialism. So some of these quotes uh, have been plucked out uh, at a later date uh, to basically make Lenin an advocate of socialism in one country. Russia is a huge country, 150 million people, largest country on the world, you know, rich in resources. Um, you know, Lenin has been painted uh, as an advocate that you could build socialism, which I understand as the rule of the working class and the transition to communism. You could do that fundamentally in isolation. Um, my basic argument is that uh, no, if you actually look at Lenin, he was an orthodox uh, Marxist. Uh, there were a few advocates of socialism in one country in the second international, but he was part of the mainstream uh, that believed uh, that although a country like Russia could spark uh, the revolution, fundamentally what would decide it is first of all Europe and then the big huge countries uh, in the world in terms of population not least China not least um, um, India so we all know uh, the history um, much to the bitter disappointment of uh, the Bolsheviks um, the bourgeoisie managed to we stabilize uh, their system after uh, the shock and horror of uh, World War I. Uh, they managed to isolate uh, the Soviet Union. And what was, I, su I suspect, unexpected is that instead of the Soviet Union going down to white uh, counter-revolution internally, okay, backed by armies of intervention, or going down uh, through external um, intervention, it survived. Um, and, and, you know, what it turned into, um, I would argue, is something um, very complex, um, something that has to be um, looked at um, in terms of its own uh, internal contradictions, how those internal contradictions work out. But what I would argue is the crucial date in terms of what we mean by the Soviet Union really was the first five year plan. And you can read any number uh, 
of different commentators from all manner of different angles. But if, if they're half honest, um, they will show, uh, you know, that working conditions, obviously the collectivization um, of agriculture, i.e. the expropriation uh, of um, the peasantry as uh, individual um, owners, as autonomous um, economic actors, that was ended. And to all intents and purposes, uh, the working class was re-enslaved. Now that needs to be qualified um, because we're not talking about wage slavery, in my view, we're not talking about chattel slavery. Nonetheless, the working class uh, was exploited. And I think that's a, um, a fundamental uh, question. We're not just dealing um, with uh, parasitism. In other words, that if we look at uh, the first five year plan, what we're actually dealing with, and again, I think you can, if, if you study the literature, opposed to the model uh, that they were uh, working, I think, um, uh, on some sort of version of what was called primitive socialist accumulation. Actually, what it turns out is that the peasantry uh, didn't produce much in the way uh, of um, surplus. Uh, it was the workers. It was uh, industrial uh, and other such workers um, where the accumulation um, fund, if you want to use ruble terms, uh, uh, came from. But of course, before that, uh, what we had uh, after the early 20s uh, was this uh, new economic policy. Um, a situation of where uh, most big industry was in state hands, uh, where trade and agriculture uh, were in private hands, and certainly when it came to trading agricultural uh, product, it was in the hands of um, a proto-capitalist uh, class, uh, the Kulaks. They accounted for the vast bulk of uh, surplus grain and uh, uh, surplus product uh, in the countryside. Um, I want to return uh, to the NEP question, really in the context of China, but I'll, I'll do that. Uh, in a little while. Suffice to say uh, that if we take the post or the, the, the Soviet Union of the five-year plans, that basically became uh, the model, certainly which uh, official communist parties uh, aspired uh, to emulate, but also has to be said uh, that the apparent success uh, of the five-year plans and the, the real successes, the undoubted uh, successes uh, of the five-year plan were also emulated um, by various capitalist states. You could talk, for example, um, about the New Deal. Um, you could talk about um, Nazi Germany, fascist Italy. Uh, they all looked uh, to the state uh, playing, um, uh, you know, um, a leading role um, um, in, in the uh, economy. But crucially, uh, this became the sort of model uh, for the workers' movement. And that would include also um, Leon Trotsky, um, who, although he decried uh, the uh, capitalist, uh, what he called the capitalist, uh, um, I should put it, uh, uh, means of exchange, i.e., the exchange of rubles for uh, products, uh, he described the um, the functioning of the economy uh, as fundamentally uh, socialistic. I think that actually is a misreading of trade, uh, let alone uh, the running of um, um, industry. Okay, so my basic uh, proposition has been um, sort of, well, it's safe to say it now, um, is that the Soviet Union uh, wasn't a mode uh, of um, production, if one means by a mode of production being a mode of reproduction. Uh, reproduction, not only of the means of production and the means of consumption, uh, but a means of production of the social relationships um, of that uh, society. And uh, what is notable uh, about the Soviet Union, and you can read this with um, 
you know, the reports, especially every five years for the five year plans, uh, but also in the reports of, um, you know, prime ministers and general secretaries uh, to communist party uh, congresses, is that the Soviet Union showed to begin with a brilliant ability uh, to either buy uh, uh, or copy, um, you know, Western uh, technology, put it into practice, uh, while it never um, performed uh, at the level that it said on the uh, can, it was always, uh, the productivity was always a problem. Nevertheless, uh, what they managed to do was build a steel industry, um, transform uh, the Soviet Union, uh, to use Stalin's phrase, into a country uh, of metal, uh, re-equip uh, the Red Army, you know, with the latest armor and uh, uh, equipment, and yes, go on uh, to withstand uh, the assault by uh, the German army and, and drive the German army uh, back uh, all the way to Berlin. Now, of course, yes, the Soviet Union got aid from Britain, crucially uh, the United States, but fundamentally uh, what it rested on was the industrial might that had been built up in the first uh, two uh, five-year plans. But what we have, um, according to the general secretaries and um, Soviet prime ministers, is a situation that in order to revolutionize uh, the means of production, what they were capable of doing and what they weren't capable of doing was revolutionizing the, how should put it, the means of production within an existing enterprise. So once you've built Magnitogorsk, uh, for example, uh, to revolutionize that particular plant uh, became highly uh, problematic uh, for all sorts of reasons I'm not gonna go into now. And therefore what you get is a pattern of industrialization that relies on building new plants. And after you've built those plants, building yet more plants. Now that was pretty unproblematic uh, until we arrive at what I would call uh, the general law of accumulation uh, in uh, the USSR. And the general law of accumulation is that uh, Soviet uh, enterprises had uh, um, a, a pressing self-interest in accumulating more and more workers. What they didn't have is what you have under capitalism and that's the economization uh, of inputs, uh, not least human uh, inputs. So for example, um, a recent news item in, in Britain um, has been that uh, uh, Amazon um, is about to shed 18,000 uh, jobs. Uh, they're opening up two new super uh, warehouses somewhere and they're closing uh, a whole number uh, of, of others. And uh, in other words, uh, what the Soviet Union didn't have um, is not only sucking workers in, uh, it had that uh, in spades, but what it didn't have is expelling workers or redeploying workers uh, um, into other areas of the economy. Now, of course, uh, what we had uh, isn't a system, although that was often the law, uh, where workers were in reality uh, tied to a particular enterprise. It's certainly true uh, that if you look at Stalin's Soviet Union, but it, this, this is true right up to Gorbachev, uh, there were, uh, you know, there was an internal passport system. You couldn't freely move to Leningrad or Moscow. Uh, formerly under Stalin, uh, workers with uh, labor books were tied to a particular enterprise. Only if you got the management saying, yeah, this person, I've agreed that that person should leave. Um, uh, if they left um, without permission, it was meant to be a criminal uh, act that they could be um, sent to Siberia, technically. But of course, what happened is because every enterprise, almost with surely without exception, 
was actually short of labor, what you get is a phenomenon whereby management actually connive with workers and they connive with workers, not only when it comes to them leaving, uh, but also actually connive with them um, against the center. So you don't have some sort of unified bureaucracy uh, that we should view as a monolith. We should view uh, the bureaucracy, if you want to use that, that word, as internally contradictory. Uh, and indeed, what you had is a situation where Stalin, of course, um, thought that everyone was lying to him. Why? Because everyone was lying to him. And of course, Stalin himself was lying. So, for example, when it came to fulfilling the year plan, the five year plan, the monthly plan, management conniving with workers were very successful in putting forward false uh, statistics. But crucially, uh, what the Soviet Union uh, uh, did is run out of people. So you had, um, in terms of you know, statistics from the 60s, 70s, uh, the Soviet Union would have an incredibly high rate of female uh, employment, uh, which you could argue is a good thing, and I'm not going to argue against that, but compa comparing with the rest of the world, the Soviet Union was right up there. So female employment compared with male employment would be something like 97%. Uh, so that includes, you know, pregnant women, uh, women looking after relatives. And that, that actually went down uh, into uh, society in a deeper way. You can illustrate that by the fact uh, that the Soviet Union also had the highest rate of employment of pensioners. So people have meant to be retired, uh, continued working for all sorts of uh, reasons I won't go into now. But the point would be uh, that you can certainly read again reports of general secretaries and uh, prime ministers openly admitting uh, that the old model of industrialization uh, is no longer uh, supportable. We are running out of people. And of course, what they look to uh, would be what you'd expect, new technology um, in order to overcome uh, that labor shortage. But again, in the same reports by general secretaries and prime ministers, uh, this is not uh, simply, um, how should I put it, a, a sort of made up story. What you have is reports, and um, it's not one or two instances, for example, of the state presiding over the importation of uh, expensive uh, American uh, computers, uh, which the management would leave out in the snow. And uh, you have to explain that. Uh, beyond the level of, well, they were just mad, or they were saboteurs, or they were foreign agents. You actually have to explain it socially, uh, why that happened, why the Soviet Union was incapable of introducing in any systematic way new technology into existing plant in order to channel uh, workers who are in short supply uh, to other parts uh, of uh, the economy. And of course, what you had is when you did open up a, a new plant is a sort of bidding war uh, between uh, various enterprise uh, managers uh, and you had clearly i'm not saying rubles were real money uh, but what you had is clearly something that went against the wishes of stalin of khrushchev of brezhnev um, i won't bother with chenenko and andropov they didn't last long enough uh, but Gorbachev, what you had is more than wage equalization. So you'll find many articles, many speeches bemoaning equalization. This isn't a socialist principle. And yet what you had is um, skilled workers, semi-skilled workers ending up in ruble terms, getting more rubles, for example, uh, than doctors or some technicians or foremen, uh, for example. Okay. So, um, what, what to say? Well, first of all, in terms of Marxism, um, there have been many sort of theorists who'd spoken about the danger of the state, um, you know, detaching itself from um, the working class. I'm talking about a worker state. 
and becoming something in it, its own right. Most of that was at the level of sort of superficiality. Um, and it has to be said that if you look back uh, to the 20s, 30s, 40s, into the 50s, into the 60s, uh, I would argue uh, that uh, what Marxists were doing was dealing with something that in theoretical terms, uh, none of them had uh, expected. Um, you know, if you look at Trotsky in the 30s, he talked about a degenerate worker's state. Uh, he talked about the Soviet Union fundamentally uh, being an unstable uh, society. And on that basis, he basically made the prediction, um, he rested his perspectives on uh, the Soviet Union not surviving uh, World War uh, II in its present form, i.e. in its Stalinist uh, form. Instead of that, as we all know, uh, it not only beat uh, the German army, uh, but through some sort of process, uh, which we can argue about, uh, that, that, that model was spread. And it was spread either via uh, the Red Army uh, or it was spread by emulation. So for example, in China, uh, Mao's uh, People's Liberation Army comes to power through a rural based uh, revolution and emulates uh, you know, the five year plan, um, the form of industrialization, uh, drives towards collectivization on, on the Soviet uh, model. We saw something similar in North Korea, North Vietnam, um, um, et cetera. Okay, so in terms of uh, theory, all sorts of ideas uh, were produced. Um, I've already mentioned Trotsky's uh, theory. I mean, in my own um, mind, the idea of a worker state where the workers um, exist as um, semi-slaves um, isn't just contradictory, uh, it's to do violence uh, to the language. That, that's really uh, um, my view of that. Let, I, I'll leave aside uh, the predictions about World War II uh, aside. But we also had, uh, you know, bureaucratic collectivism representing some sort of unexpected, um, how she put it, uh, intermediate stage that would be reproduced globally uh, between capitalism and socialism. So that was one theory. There were other versions of bureaucratic um, collectivism that emphasized uh, the uniqueness uh, of the Soviet Union. Others. Uh, talked about bureaucratic collectivism um, in terms of backward uh, countries. So, for example, when the Soviet model was spread to Cuba, uh, but more importantly, I would expect uh, to places in the former uh, Portuguese uh, empire, such as Angola, uh, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, um, you had uh, Afghanistan, Yemen, um, the, the, it was theorized, well, there's no possibility of these countries going towards socialism, uh, but bureaucratic collectivism would at least create the uh, material conditions required for socialism when the working class in the West get their act together uh, and take power uh, in their own right. Um, and in that sort of spirit, we also actually have uh, a number of uh, versions of state capitalism. We're not talking about state capitalism of the sort that Lenin discussed in the 20s and Zinoviev discussed in the 20s. Um, we're talking about um, sort of Tony Cliff's uh, version of it, um, of where the Soviet Union is compelled to accumulate uh, because of external um, contradictions. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Tony Cliff talks, for example, uh, about uh, the Soviet bureaucracy being a single employer um, of workers, basically being slaves, not semi-slaves, not free to move one enterprise to another, because that was against the law, doesn't matter what happened in practice. But basically, uh, Tony Cliff made the argument in his uh, famous book, State Capitalism in Russia, or various other titles, but you know the one I'm talking about, early 50s, um, that the Soviet Union represented something higher uh, 
um, than traditional uh, capitalism. So in that sense, at least, uh, it was a form of um, the theory of bureaucratic uh, collectivism. So for Cliff, um, what you had is the nationalization of the means of production uh, and capitalism was incapable of um, uh, taking any further step. This was the ultimate limit um, of capitalism. And of course, there was another version, which we're much more familiar with, I, I suspect, nowadays, much more uh, familiar version of bureaucratic collectivism. And that's the bureaucratic collectivism uh, that was advocated by Max Schachmann uh, uh, back, um, well, in particular, the 60s uh, that led him uh, to side with uh, the attempt to overthrow the Castro uh, uh, leadership in Cuba, um, got him to line up with uh, the US forces in the Vietnam War, and today has uh, organizations such as the Alliance for Workers' Liberty uh, in Britain, uh, defending Israel, um, supporting, or who are we to object uh, to uh, the US-UK uh, Gulf War, uh, the overthrow of um, the government of um, Gaddafi uh, in Libya, and one could go on also, uh, in America, that was obviously um, the original form of the DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, and was it Patrick Harrington? I think it was Patrick, not Paul, Patrick Harrington. Okay. Um, my own uh, view has been very much shaped by uh, the writings of um, Hillel uh, Tikhtin, who basically said, well, look, you know, uh, what we actually need is not uh, labels uh, when it comes to the Soviet Union, but we actually need to apply the method of Marxism uh, to the Soviet Union. How, for example, was the surplus product extracted? Who controlled the surplus product? What contradictions are there uh, in the Soviet Union? And it needs to be analyzed in and of itself, but you need to study it, uh, not uh, to draw historical analogies. Uh, historical analogies are always very useful, especially when we're faced with novel historic uh, developments. We, you know, we, I don't think we can think in any other way. Or oh, this is a bit like X, or this is a bit like Y. But that should only be the first step. Um, and so what I want to do, um, uh, um, how should I put what we got? Um, for the next part um, of this introduction is really try to have a think uh, about China, but have a think about China um, really in the context uh, of uh, the Soviet Union. Because uh, as I said, if you look at uh, Mao and the Communist Party of China, uh, the People's Liberation Army, uh, that uh, regime that came to power in 1949, it clearly copied, um, not exactly, but in broad terms, it copied uh, what they saw uh, in the Soviet Union. And of course, they had lots of advisors coming over from the Soviet Union, a whole generation of um, uh, Chinese um, intellectuals uh, learned Russian, um, uh, Russia clearly, or the Soviet Union, uh, um, was what they aspired uh, to emulate. But of course, what we now have um, is a situation of where, at least in terms of uh, Chinese commentators who might be interested in claiming some sort of Marxist uh, legitimacy uh, for the present regime, what they look to, of course, uh, as their model isn't Stalin's Soviet Union um, of the five-year plans, uh, but the Soviet Union of um, Lenin, uh, Bukharin, and Stalin, um, basically between 1921, uh, 1928, stroke uh, nine, and the launch of the five-year plan. In other words, uh, the new economic uh, policy. Just, I thought comrades might be interested to know, uh, I found it quite... Um, how should you put it, um, surprising uh, that if you look at the People's Publishing House in Beijing, they actually have got a um, collected works of Bukharin. Um, 
this is in Chinese, uh, obviously, but I was quite um, uh, struck uh, uh, by that. They also have some writings of, believe it or not, of Zinoviev in Chinese and also Rykov. So clearly in terms of uh, justifying, um, you know, the course that the regime has taken, what we have is a looking back, not to the 30s, uh, but a looking back uh, to the 1920s, if only in terms of uh, ideological uh, justification, an attempt to show where China is today, owes something to orthodox, well, I'll call it Leninism, um, um, for the want of anything better uh, for the moment. Okay, so what I want to ask um, is really, um, was um, the Soviet collapse 89, 91 inevitable? My answer to that was, or will be, um, not in terms of the date. Um, the Soviet Union, in, from everything I've read, uh, was collapsed internally. Uh, yes, it had external pressures um, um, on it. Uh, the Cold War was becoming uh, ever more uh, intense. We saw the promotion of the uh, Mujahideen uh, counter-revolution in Afghanistan, successfully getting uh, the Soviet army involved um, and successfully giving it uh, uh, a pretty thorough hammering uh, in a war that they couldn't win. But the Soviet Union, yes, was uh, collapsed internally. The bureaucracy pulled uh, the plug. Um, as I said, I don't think that the, the timing was inevitable. I don't think it was inevitable uh, that the bureaucracy had to pull the plug. Um, it could have gone another course, but what course um, for the life of me, I can't really um, say because the myth will be today uh, amongst a lot of, how should you put it, Sinophiles uh, on the left, that if only they'd adopted uh, the Chinese uh, model, if only they'd gone back uh, to NEP. Well, the argument, at least in the 20s, uh, between uh, the left opposition and the uh, Bukharin, um, Stalin uh, bloc uh, was basically, look, the problem with NEP uh, this is from the Priyavizhensky, Trotsky, left opposition point of view, is yes, we have two economic systems in which we can describe one as socialist, that's what at least Bukharin uh, did. I think that should be with all sorts of qualifications, but let's just use it as shorthand. And then we've got this um, um, Netmen, uh, Kulak uh, economy on the other. Uh, you all know the quote from Bukharin, you know, um, uh, let's industrialize uh, at the pace of the peasants uh, nag. Uh, basically what Bikarin um, um, relied on is the development of capitalism in the countryside, taxing uh, the countryside and using the surplus in order to build up um, industry. And the problem with that is, is almost certainly what was happening and certainly what would happen is that through corruption, um, the party itself uh, becomes um, subordinate to capital accumulation, uh, and indeed the country goes in the direction of uh, capitalism and is either then brought up uh, by um, foreign uh, capitalists or it produces its own uh, capitalists. And uh, given that the left opposition was looking to international revolution as the solution and restoring power uh, to the working class, that was hardly uh, an attractive uh, prospect. So in other words, um, Priyabizhensky uh, painted these two systems um, that existed uh, in the Soviet Union as antagonistic, that one had to overcome the other, uh, that the two couldn't survive uh, in any permanent uh, relationship. On the other hand, Bikarin at least uh, put forward, at least most consistently, uh, the idea that they could cohabit uh, for an indefinite period uh, before um, socialism eventually flowers and you get rid of all the shit like uh, money, classes, the state, 
um, and all of that uh, baggage. So, OK, I don't know um, whether the Soviet Union uh, could have taken that route, but I, I very much uh, doubt it. And certainly when you look at uh, Gorbachev, uh, and I think that was an attempt um, um, to take that particular route, what it produced um, wasn't, um, how should I put it, um, an economic boom, uh, but disintegration. Um, we not only saw various republics uh, break apart, but we saw the whole structure um, of society itself uh, come apart, that uh, uh, you had a tendency at almost every level uh, towards autarky, uh, to the point where, you know, workers would be outside factories selling off bits uh, of the factory. Uh, uh, the division of labour um, uh, disintegrated, and we all know uh, at the end, as I said, uh, the bureaucracy itself pulls the plug. Uh, why did they pull the plug? Not to make uh, um, uh, put it, the country big and powerful, but precisely to buy into um, wealth, a capitalist uh, wealth. Um, and clearly, you know, under Yeltsin, uh, what you had is the, um, you know, the birth of million, many millionaires, many billionaires, some from within um, the Communist Party and the governing machinery, uh, others um, from a sort of criminal uh, uh, background. Okay, so China uh, would appear to um, contradict um, that, that that didn't need to uh, happen. Well, I've put forward two basic um, arguments here. And that's, first of all, if we look at the history of uh, the Soviet Union, um, while it developed its own steel industry and while it developed its own powerful war industry, it was never, in spite of the myths, um, fully independent um, of the world market. So, for example, although it didn't actually occur, the first five year plan was predicated, for example, on selling um, huge amounts of grain um, uh, to the West. And, and instead of that, of course, what happened is the global slump and collectivization proved to be a disaster. Nonetheless, what uh, we saw in terms of the Soviet Union, even when it came to the oil boom, is the Soviet Union basically fundamentally uh, was a supplier of raw materials uh, to the West. So although you had things like larder cars, they're the exception uh, rather than uh, uh, the rule. Okay, so what about uh, China? Well, my basic argument will be here. We, of course, have to look to internal contradictions, internal laws. Um, you know, you ain't going to produce um, a chicken, uh, no matter how long some chicken sits on a stone, uh, for example. But China precisely uh, was viewed after the uh, Nixon Kissinger uh, uh, visit, certainly with uh, the death of Mao and the overthrow of the so-called Gang of Four and uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping, was viewed as a strategic asset uh, against uh, the Soviet Union. And it, it's, it's not an irrelevant, so I think it's highly relevant uh, that if we look at uh, the United States, it granted China most favored nation status in 1980. And what you saw uh, was a situation of where Chinese capital uh, that existed outside China went in uh, to China, uh, but also uh, the United States took a benign view of the industrialization. Uh, of China, didn't view it as a threat. And I'm sure that they convinced themselves uh, that uh, given the right conditions, uh, China would develop in a friendly direction as far as they were concerned, not only in terms of uh, fighting the Cold War uh, against the Soviet Union, but would open itself up and become not a, um, a bourgeois democracy. I really do find that term um, uh, problematic. It's almost as if with capitalism, uh, you expect democracy. But what they would mean by that is a rule of law uh, system uh, that would allow them uh, and their transnationals uh, 
and the transnationals of Japan and Europe uh, to buy up on the cheap uh, the commanding heights uh, of uh, the Chinese economy. Now, of course, that hasn't happened. The Chinese have blocked uh, um, any such uh, attempts. And we then get into the situation that we now have of some sort of Cold War uh, between um, uh, the United States, the so-called West, uh, and uh, China, and the possibility, uh, not, uh, and not only when it comes to Taiwan, uh, of that uh, uh, turning um, hot. Okay. Um, okay, so what, what I would be um, um, arguing, what I'm arguing in terms of uh, closing, is that uh, China clearly isn't uh, the Soviet Union, it didn't begin uh, with the proletarian revolution, uh, certainly uh, now uh, isn't committed to uh, international uh, revolution, uh, far uh, from it. And whether uh, it, its a particular version of whatever you want to call it, market socialism, venture state capitalism, state capitalism, bureaucratic state capitalism, proto-socialist state, whatever you want to call it, um, I would argue uh, that it's fundamentally, um, excuse me, fundamentally um, um, un unstable. What will happen, uh, I'm not going to hazard uh, a guess. Uh, apart from saying uh, that in the same way uh, that the particular moment um, that, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed, the fact that it collapsed and disintegrated, I, I think that that is an accident of um, history. But what I would argue is that China isn't a sustainable model, certainly isn't a model uh, that leads, as many of their left-wing apologists or its apologists argue, uh, to some sort of um, um, socialism. Uh, in other words, I would argue uh, that China actually represents a historic dead end uh, rather than representing uh, the future. That's it.